Hello everyone, welcome to the latest webinar from our Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program in Strengthening Health Systems, brought to you by the McMaster Health Forum at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. For today's webinar, I'll provide you with a little bit of information on the McMaster Health Forum, the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program, and the current version of the scholarship that's offered by the Forum. I'll then turn things over to our incoming scholar presenter, who's Kiyango, visiting us from Uganda. He's going to be talking about his work on malarial control strategies. Here at the McMaster Health Forum, we aim to be the leading hub for improving health outcomes through collective problem solving. We harness information, convene stakeholders, and prepare action-oriented leaders. We act as an agent of change by empowering stakeholders. The current Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program is run by a partnership between the Rideau Hall Foundation, Community Foundations of Canada, Universities Canada, and individual Canadian universities. The purpose of the scholarship program is to activate a dynamic community of young global leaders across the Commonwealth to create lasting impacts both at home and abroad through cross-cultural exchanges encompassing international education, discovery, inquiry, and professional experiences. The current version of the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program that's offered here at the McMaster Health Forum is called Strengthening Health Systems. Our scholars will contribute to strengthening health systems and become part of our large and growing network of health system leaders. The Forum's current QES program has had three cohorts of students. The first cohort, and you can see on the screen here, comprised students who mainly went away or visited us in the calendar year of 2016. Our second cohort of scholars, which comprised 22 students, primarily engaged in their scholarship in the calendar year of 2017. The third and final cohort of the current version of the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program here at the McMaster Health Forum primarily went away or visited us in the calendar year of 2018. Today's presenter comes from the large group of incoming scholars who worked with us in the spring and summer of 2018. Today's incoming scholar presenter is Kayango, who comes to us from our partners at Makerere University in Uganda. He is working on his master's in clinical epidemiology there. His graduate work involves the evaluation of potential utilization of reactive case detection as a possible malaria control strategy in a malaria elimination setting. Kiango strives to gain the skills of pushing for policy using research evidence and thus contribute to the eventual control of infectious disease. Kiango, over to you. Okay, um, good morning. My name is Kiango Edward. I'm presenting about the potential utility of reactive case detection as a malaria control strategy following the use of indoor residual spray, which I'll call IRS. Uh, the study was conducted in Nagongera, Toro District, Uganda. The supervisors are uh, Professor Joan Kaliango and Dr. Joanita Nankabira. So, um, elimination of malaria is the point we are going to discuss today. This this is uh, on the government uh, the government agenda. So, how did it get to find its way to the government agenda? So, the problem is that we have over 95 percent of the country being endemic uh, with malaria and the remaining 5 percent is prone to epidemics. These are seasonal depending on the climate change at the time. So malaria on its own, it accounts for 30 to 50 percent of the outpatient visits in, in Ugandan hospitals and it accounts for 15 to 20 percent of admissions into hospitals in Uganda. So it is still such a big problem and it requires urgent attention. So it, um, that problem coupled with the policies, we have several policies in Uganda. So there are so many malaria control strategies that are being currently used in Uganda. There is a LLIN that is long-lasting insecticide mosquito nets, um, which in some regions they are being called uh, treated mosquito nets. There is uh, indoor residual spray. There is IPT, which is uh, intermittent, uh, intermittent preventive therapy which is usually used especially for the prone populations like the pregnant women who are more prone to getting malaria and uh, children who have sickle cell. They are not really prone to malaria, but when they get malaria, it's really bad. It becomes severe and complicated malaria in that particular population. Then there is the policy of uh, treatment. Whoever has been discovered to have malaria, they should be treated. Uh, this is in a way to prevent the spread of malaria because 
the mosquito to to spread malaria, it has to bite a person who has the parasite and bite another person without the parasite then spread. So if you can actually treat with the person who is sick, in a way you are controlling the spread of malaria. So uh, there is increased coverage of these control interventions. This has been brought about by several programs, which include the Presidential Malaria Initiative, um, the Dependent WHO programs, then you have the malaria control uh, program in Uganda, which is also aiding to do that. We have different research organizations that are coming on board to help fight malaria by distributing mosquito nets and helping with IRS. Then um, the Ugandan policy, when it comes to detecting individuals who have malaria, they usually go for passive case detection, where an individual who is sick takes himself to hospital and that's the only way that the individual is captured by the system and then they get treated. So it leaves a big gap, a very huge gap for people who will not come to hospital, especially if they are sick or they have parasites and they are not actually sick and they are walking around with parasites. So um, from these policies, the feedback that is being observed is uh, persistence of malaria and uh, in some regions, there are epidemics that are being observed in some places following the different interventions. Um, IRS that is being used in Uganda has a half-life of about uh, one year. So within two years, its um, activity drops. So protection drops with the IRS. So in some regions, there have been observed increased number of cases following the depletion of IRS. So that is the... That is what is coming back from the different policies and interventions that are being used. So um, when it comes to the political stream, um, generally there is consensus from the ruling government and the opposition that there is need to actually improve the health in the country with particular emphasis being paid to malaria. And then the, there is also an appreciation of the need to step up different malaria control interventions. This is from within and without the country. So the different participants in this, we have the Malaria Control Program, we have the Means of Health, we have uh, the World Health Program, Presidential Malaria Initiative, and we have different academics who are coming on board to push for this agenda. So all that coupled together, push the elimination of malaria to the decision agenda. That's a need to beef up or augment the current malaria control strategies in an effort to eliminate malaria in the country. So. For our presentation today, we are going to define malaria as a condition of having fever and a confirmed presence of plasmodium parasites in the blood uh, using um, microscopy blood smear. We, we decided to rule out the use of um, rapid diagnostic kits because they are antigen-based uh, tests and uh, para antigens can stay in the blood longer even after clearing the parasites. So they would give a lot of false positives compared if we go for the blood smear. The, we shall define an index case as an individual who has been confirmed to have malaria at the health center through uh, detected through passive case detection. Then we shall define an index control as an individual who has been confirmed not to have malaria but has a fever. And this person should have brought themselves to the health center through passive case detection. Then asymptomatic plasmodium parasitemia, going forward, which we shall call APP, is a condition of having plasmodium parasites within your blood, but actually you have no clinical signs and symptoms of malaria. So most likely you will never seek for treatment. You remain in the community as a result of these parasites and able to spread following hospital bites. So um, passive case detection, we have a, a sick individual. This individual goes to the health center and seeks treatment. The person gets treated, and that's the end of the story. Then for reactive case detection, we have a sick individual who goes to the health center. He gets treated, but there is an additional step of the people at the health center following the sick individual back to his household and check everyone within the household to, to confirm presence of parasites. This could be asymptomatic. They could actually be sick people, or they could be... Uh, in the preclinical stage heading to becoming sick. The biggest problem is the asymptomatic population which will never seek for treatment because they are practically not sick but they are moving around with the parasites. So the reactive case detection brings an added advantage of actually detecting more of the people who have the parasites in the community compared to passive case detection which will only treat the sick individuals. So 
in the, uh, in the study, we are trying to see whether we can change policy from the use of passive case detection in the, um, in the identification of people who have malaria, so, and we use reactive case detection to capture more people with malaria with the idea that if you actually clear out the asymptomatic individuals in the community, you are reducing on the parasite pool within the community and thus leading towards the elimination of malaria. So it is more of a, a policy issue. The, the idea is right on the government agenda. It's just a matter of coming up with a new policy. So we are trying to inform policy in this particular case. So this is just um, a look at the problem. Uh, so the introduction of health malaria is still a major cause of mortality and morbidity in Uganda. So uh, in the year 2013, we had approximately 3.6 million cases of malaria. And uh, we had approximately 6,000 deaths from malaria alone in the year 2013. <laughs> However, because of this, there are several malaria control programs that have been put in place, and IRS is proving to be very effective because it uh, reduces the mosquito population and reduces transmission from one person to the next. So following the use of IRS, following IRS depletion, there is a rise in malaria prevalence. This could be attributed to several reasons. Previously, there so probably people had partial immunity, and they, had, they haven't been exposed to uh, mosquito bites for quite a while because of IRS. So the next time they get a mosquito bite, it's very easy to progress from to, to the clinical disease because your immunity has dropped. So, however, the question lingers around. If we've used IRS and reduced the mosquito population and the number of um, malaria cases has dropped, then where are the mosquitoes, the, the, the mosquitoes which are bleeding following the depletion of IRS, where are they getting the parasites? This points to two sources of parasites. Either you have travelers into the region who will come in with the malaria, or you actually have reservoirs of these parasites within the community. There is really nothing much you can do about the travelers coming into the region with malaria, probably from one district to another, but you can do something about the reservoirs. If you can identify these reservoirs of the parasites, then you can clear them. So the reservoirs are the people of asymptomatic Plasmodium parasitemia. So asymptomatic individuals are missed by passive case detection and can only be diagnosed using reactive case detection. That's the need to study the utility of reactive case detection following IRS use. So despite the several control programs, malaria is still a big burden in the country. Following IRS depletion, there is a rise in the number of malaria cases. And um, in northern Uganda, there, are, there was a reported number of 658 deaths following the depletion of IRS, which is quite huge. Actually, it surpassed the previous levels, which turns out to be an epidemic. This points to a reserve of the parasites within the community. However, the program, the programmatic detection is by passive case detection. So we need to assess whether we can use reactive case detection. Previous studies that have tried to assess the use of reactive case detection, they've never compared um, the number of people you would capture if you used uh, reactive test detection compared to what you would capture compared uh, if you use passive test detection. They just keep telling you that reactive test detection gives you this more number of people, but you do not know the effectiveness of its use. So current malaria control policy utilizes passive case detection, which misses individuals with asymptomatic plasmodium parasitemia. Epidemic so in the depletion of IRS has been attributed to asymptomatic individuals. So uh, we need to, to look at the magnitude and factors that are associated with asymptomatic plasmodium parasitemia. And uh, if we actually get to identify the factors that are associated with asymptomatic plasmodium parasitemia, we can come up with a concept we call targeted reactive case detection. So for targeted reactive case detection, you identify a group of characteristics which you can use to target those particular individuals. Let's say probably it is an, uh, some age group where most likely you find asymptomatic individuals or it's sex or some other characteristic, probably wealth indicators, something like that. That can be used to target a particular characteristic and instead of screening everyone in the household, you go for particular variables within that household to maximize utilization of resources. So the objective was to compare the prevalence of uh, parasitemia 
in households with an index case compared to households without an index case, that is the index control households, then to determine the factors that are associated with asymptomatic plasmodium parasitemia among individuals with an index case of malaria presenting at Nagongera Health Center 4. That's the conceptual framework. I can skip that. So the methods used in the study, this was a, a cross-sectional study. It was quantitative in nature. We didn't have any qualitative aspect to it. Everything was uh, numbers. Uh, the study site was uh, households within 10 kilometers radius of Nagongera Health Center 4. Study population where the household members to resided in the households. So here is the twist about the study. How you identify the household members is through the index case and the index control. The index case and index control are not the study participants, but it is the household members of these people who are the study participants. So the inclusion criteria, the index case and the index control, they must uh, be residing within the 10 kilometer radius of Nagunga Health Center for diagnosed with clinical malaria for the index case. And uh, those ones who are index controls, they have a fever, but without malaria and they should have given consent to partake in the study. Household members, they should have stayed in the household for at least two weeks and they should have provided informed consent or assent to partake in the study. If you haven't stayed in the household for at least two weeks, we consider you a traveler and in this particular study, we wanted to go with travelers, we wanted to look at reservoirs within the community. Exclusion criteria, individuals below 18 years presenting at health center um, without an adult because they couldn't provide consent on their own. Uh, we have uh, assent, consent, then we can combine consent and assent in Uganda. So if you are below 18 years, you do not provide consent. You provide assent, which really doesn't uh, cut it for our study. Then if you are um, below 15 years, you provide assent and consent with the adult. So if you've showed up to the health center without an adult and you are below 18, we couldn't get an adult to consent along with your assent. So you had to exclude those individuals. Household members, individual not present at sampling, individual who could not respond adequately to the study questions, and individual with confirmed and treated malaria in the past two weeks prior to being sampled. Because we are targeting asymptomatics, so if you were treated in the last two weeks, practically you were clinically ill, you could have fallen, you could have been captured as an index case assuming we had got you two weeks earlier. So those are the study variables we collected. Our dependent variable are the symptomatic plasmodium parasitemia, it's the outcome variable. Then the predictor or independent variables, the list is provided above. So sample size for objective one, we had 62 in the household without an index case and 62 in the household with an index case. However, because of the clustering effect, if, uh, because people are clustered within households, we had to use the design effect of two, which takes us to 124 participants per household. Then for objective two, where we are looking at factors associated, we used age as the factor to consider and we ended up with uh, 59 individuals in each group and we adjusted for missing data, which gave us a total of 130, meaning it, uh, we needed 65 individuals at least to answer our questions. Um, sampling on data collection, index case and control identified at the hospital, consent sold from the household head, then questionnaires we administered for eligibility to each household member and for data collection, we had the uh, a screening tool which was assessing eligibility, then we had the actual data collection form. Then for blood collection, we used the finger prick to collect the, the blood sample. We prepared the microscope slides in the field, then we also collected the blood on protein savers. This, the, the protein savers, the blood was stored for future use because we intend to do molecular tests on the blood. We want to do uh, lamp that is uh, a shortened version of uh, PCR to, to confirm presence of parasites beyond microscopy, also to do gene typing on them to confirm that if we found a strain of parasite within, the, within a household and more than one person in the household has parasites, we want to confirm that they are actually the same strain of the parasite. Data analysis, starter version 14 was used, um, sorry, uh, that was supposed to be objective one. We used univariate and objective two. We used univariate by evaluate and multivariate. Uh, GEE, generalized estimating equations, was used because there was uh, 
clustering. Then uh, we went ahead and used the robust standard errors to control still for clustering. So quality control, research assistants were trained before we started data collection, questionnaires were pre-tested, two independent microscopies were used, and a tiebreaker was added in case the first two readings weren't concurring. The reading from the third microscopy was taken as the final reading because that would make it two versus one. Data was double entered in epi data and um, cross-checked to confirm that two entries were compared to confirm that the data has been entered. We sought permission from 25 media units to undertake the study. Um, ethical approval was sought from two IRBs, SOMREC, which is the IRB in medical school, then Uganda National Council of Science and Technology, because it was a field study. Informed consent was obtained from all participants. Then participant identification numbers were used rather than names. This is uh, for privacy in case someone lands on the, the questionnaires. You do need to protect the participants. Then those who were found to have asymptomatic plasmodium parasitemia were informed of the condition. But in Uganda, we don't have any policy of treating asymptomatic individuals. So we just informed them, and it was up to them to decide whether to go to the hospital for treatment or to wait for the parasites to clear or to actually fall sick. So the results, at the time we are collecting that, uh, we are collecting that data. We had a total of um, 1,117 individuals reporting to the health center for different conditions. Uh, these were referred to the lab for a BS. Uh, of these individuals, we had 245 individuals who had a positive BS and 872 didn't have a positive BS. So the breakdown continues and this ended up with 277 individuals from the households with an index case and 124 individuals from households without an index case. So those are our results. I'll skip ahead to the major findings. So our major finding was if we if we are to compare prevalence of asymptomatic plasmodium parasitemia in individuals with an index case compared to individuals without an index case, we found that we had the a 10.5% prevalence of plasmodium parasites in households without an index case. And we had 13% in households with an index case. So if you compare those two and you decide to compute odds ratios and the like, you end up with a non-significant p-value, which is 0.54. But that is the crude analysis. At that point, you haven't controlled for anything yet. So if you control for clustering. If you control for clustering and also decide to control for other variables in the work, uh, all the other variables were really not significant. Age was the only factor that was uh, affecting the prevalence we've observed. So if you control for age and also for clustering, you find that the odds ratio that is comparing the two prevalences is 0 0.92. This was an insignificant uh, odds ratio with a p-value of 0 0.72 and a confidence interval of 0 0.5 uh, to 1.4, which crosses the null. So from this result, we actually see that reactive case detection doesn't provide any added advantage to, to to the detection of individuals with plasmodium parasites. Because individuals from households which had a, an index case, they have almost the same prevalence as individuals from households without an index case. Whereas when you have to do reactive case detection, you would only follow individuals from households with an index case. So it doesn't make any sense to actually go ahead and do that according to our study. However, it had several limitations in the study, which, which shall come up later. Then. If you decide to look at factors associated with asymptomatic plasmodium parasitemia, you actually find that age of participants are the only factor that was associated with asymptomatic plasmodium parasitemia from, from an index case household. So in case you are to partake into doing a targeted reactive case detection, age is the factor that you would consider. And uh, in this particular study, we actually find that age group 6 to 15 has twice more like you are two times uh, likely to find asymptomatic individuals compared to age group 0 to 5 and age group of about 15 years. So in case you have limited resources, 
and you decide to do reactive test detection and you go into a person's household, you would rather use those resources on the age group 6 to 15 because that's where you are most likely going to find individuals who are asymptomatic. So in our discussion, the prevalence of asymptomatic plasmodium parasitemia in households with an index case, prevalence of APP was found to be 13.0% from the household with an index case. Actually, this is very much comparable to what was reported in a study that was done in Peru. They reported a prevalence of 10%. So we thought that these results are comparable because both regions have used IRS and in both studies microscopy was used, no molecular test was used. However, a study that was conducted in India in reg different regions of varying malaria prevalence and intensities um, and they went ahead and used PCR, which is a molecular test. PCR is poly polymerase chain reaction. They used PCR to test for their asymptomatic plasmodium parasitemia. They found a wide range of 0 to 45. This is way much higher than what we got because of the difference in intensity of malaria and also the, the test used in detecting for the presence of parasites in the body. Then uh, a study that was done in Thailand province, Western Cambodia, showed a prevalence of 1.1%. This region has a, mole a, low molecule, a, a low mosquito population, and most infections occur away from home. When individuals are done with work, they go hang out in bars and different places, and that's where most infections occur. So by the time they come back home, they've already been infected by that. Parasite. So when you do a uh, when you do reactive test detection and check people within the household, you will find that individuals who rarely go out actually don't have the parasites compared to the people who hang out a lot. So comparison of prevalence of Plasmodium parasitemia in house in the different households. So we have the overall prevalence being 12.2. When we compare, we have 13 and 10.5. So this gives us a relative difference of 23.8. Much as the odds ratio comparing the two prevalences is 0 0.92, um, when you decide to, to, to do a relative difference, it is 23.8%. That is a very big difference compared to, uh, it's a very big difference when you look at the debilitating effects malaria has in sub-Saharan Africa. So probably reactive test detection can be considered for that and not specifically because of the observed odds ratios. So these results are similar to a study that was conducted, conducted in Pailin province, but there are infections are occurring away from home compared to in Nagongera where actually infections occur at home. So the factors associated with plasmodium parasitemia among individuals in households with an index case of malaria. Age was the only factor that was significantly associated with asymptomatic plasmodium parasitemia in households with an index case of malaria. These results concur with other results, that, uh, other studies that are conducted in Ethiopia, where they actually also obtained an age group of 6 to 15, which is very similar to what we obtained. However, they differ from the study that was conducted in Puerto Rico, Puerto Quero, where the older population had a higher prevalence of plasmodium parasitemia compared to the case in Uganda. So sex was not significantly associated with asymptomatic plasmodium parasitemia. This differs from the study that was conducted in Ethiopia where actually sex was significantly associated. We, we don't know why and we failed to get an explanation for that. All the other variables that we studied in our study um, weren't studied before, so we couldn't compare them with any other study that has been previously done. So the limitations of our study, our study did not utilize the molecular test for the detection of plasmodium parasites. The study was not powered enough to answer the objective on prevalence in an index case household. So if you are to answer the objective of what is the prevalence of asymptomatic plasmodium parasitemia in, in just one household and you're not comparing the two households, we needed over 300 individuals in just that one household. Yet the maximum we got was 274. So it wasn't really powered enough to answer that objective. We didn't do any gene typing uh, to confirm that the same parasite strain is in, is, is in the individuals within the same household. So in order for you to actually confirm that it is the same mosquito bite that led to two different individuals in the household having parasites, it should be the same parasite strain, the same gene map when you type it out. But we didn't do that, so we couldn't confirm that. Then the, when we are doing growth index, we use just a subset of the characteristics that are used in determining wealth index. So probably if you do the full wealth index, you might find that our categorization might differ for the different households.
However, we collected the blood samples, as I told you, for gene typing and for PCR, which we hope to do sometime next year. So in conclusion, reactive case detection did not show much added advantage as an appropriate malaria control strategy following the use of window residue spray. The odds ratio comparing the two households was 0.92, which was not significant. However, there was a high relative difference of 23.8 in the prevalences of asymptomatic plasmodium parasitemia in the two households, which is suggestive of the clinical importance of reactive case detection. Age is the only factor that was significantly associated with asymptomatic plasmodium parasitemia with age group 15 to with age group 5 to 15 years having significantly higher prevalence of plasmodium parasitemia compared to the people who are below 5 and the people who are above 15 years. So thus, if you are to do reactive case detection, age would be an appropriate factor to consider for the targeted reactive case detection. So our recommendations from the study are quite simple. We recommend that a similar study should be performed following long-term use of IRS to actually see because the Inagongela IRS has been used for about five years. So we are hoping that probably if you've used IRS for more than five years, let's say 10 years, you could actually observe a good difference and probably reactive test detection would be uh, a good option to use. Then a study that incorporates a molecular test should be done and there is also need to control for the evening places where people go after work so that you can, rule, you can rule them out as potential sources of parasites in this particular population. Those are my references. And I would like to thank Mackay University for allowing me to undertake the study. The supervisors and the mentors that I worked with, the, college, the, the study team that enabled me to collect the data, the study participants who allowed us to do our study with them, Mapmaster Health Forum for the opportunity of giving me actually to explore these things. The, the Kingdom framework, the 3i plus e framework, quite informative because I did the policy work, but I couldn't break it down properly until I came here to, to the levels of the three Ps. Then also to thank the different QES scholars for the interaction we've had and the Queen Elizabeth <coughs> Diamond, Diamond, Queen Elizabeth the second Diamond Scholarship for giving me the opportunity to come to McMaster University. Thank you very much. For those of you who are able to make it here today to watch the presentation in person, I want to thank you for coming out. For those of you that have uh, watched the video later on on YouTube, thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, before we leave you today, I just want to take a minute to go over a couple of the links that are on the screen to provide you with additional information about our program and what our scholars have been doing. Uh, if you're interested in the forum's Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program, either the current program which is ending in 2018 or the new program which is actually being launched in mid to late 2018 I would encourage you to please click that first link that will take you to the information page at our the McMaster Health Forum's website and t tell you all the information you need to know about our Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program in terms of how to apply and how to be involved. If you're interested in other presentations and webinars by our Queen Elizabeth Scholars, I would encourage you to click on that second link. There you'll find all of the current webinars uh, that have been done by all of our Queen Elizabeth Scholars and future webinars uh, that our scholars will be doing will also be posted there. And thirdly, you'll see that there is a link for our scholars blog page, which is machealthformscholars.com. Our scholars write blogs about personal reflections about their experiences while abroad or when they visited Canada if they were an international scholar. So please uh, visit that page and read some of the blogs that our scholars have posted. Feel free to follow us on Twitter at MacHealthForum and please follow the hashtag QB Scholars so you can see all of the fun and exciting things that scholars have been doing from multiple universities around Canada. Thank you for joining us and we'll hope to see you again soon.